Welcome to Talking Tuesday. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today we're going to talk about my favorite sports. So this seems a little off topic here, but a subscriber asked me in a Q&A form um, to talk about if I'm into sports, if I like sports, uh, what are my sports I'm involved in, do I participate in sports, things like that. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of in general, just motocross, dedication, character, and kind of the struggle behind the sport and why I like it. So I'm not a huge sports fan. So this shouldn't come as a surprise to a lot of you. Uh, even growing up, like my dad didn't really like sports. I mean, I look at sports as like, it's great, right? It's football, basketball, baseball. Um, I don't really get sports, to be honest with you. Like a bunch of people get behind a team and they're super excited and a team like plays a sport, right? And you're excited because it's my local team, right? Let's say I'm from Washington, so you like the Seahawks for football. Uh, and you're like, okay, I love the Seahawks. I don't get it a lot of times from the team mentality because like what happens if your favorite quarterback changes teams? So as a kid, right, I watched the Broncos because I was born in Colorado um, and John Elway was the quarterback. John Elway's awesome. I even have, if you look over here, so I'll do this for the the video, but you can't see on the podcast. Uh, Over here, um, there's a football and it has a John Elway autographed football and it has bears in it. I don't really like sports though. I don't like football. But again, it was my local team. But what happens if that person transfers teams to another team? Right? I just, I don't know. For me, team sports are kind of odd. Uh, for sports, so what I do watch, I do watch basketball and football somewhat for the University of Michigan and for Washington State University. I feel I have a closer tie to them. I feel like more bonded to the universities I went to. I like the universities. I like the experiences I had there, right? I kind of feel the connection there, so I watch it. I'm a huge Michigan football fan, so in general, in basketball. Uh, I do like WSU as well. We're always the underdogs. But again, it's not like it's my life. It doesn't really kind of define me. Um, But motocross and supercross, so for those of you that don't know what these are, uh, these are off-road motorcycle racing on dirt. So they're tracks, they have jumps and corners and everything. Uh, I grew up as a kid, I started riding at the age of 12. Um, I loved to ride when I first got my bike. A buddy of mine had a bike. My dad got me a bike, my mom didn't want it. Um, (laughs) Whole long story there. Anyways, turns out a few years later I started racing and I absolutely loved it. But I think the reason I like motocross and I still watch it today and I still have fans, I'm a huge Eli Tomac fan. Um, so now that you can't see on the podcast, but I'll show here on the YouTube channel, uh, is I have a Ricky Carmichael signed Jersey. So I was a big Ricky Carmichael fan back in the day. I still think he's pretty cool. Um, he's retired and everything now. He's known as the goat, the greatest of all time because of his records. Um, but I'm a huge Eli Tomac fan now. I love motocross. I love supercross, but I think the reasoning behind this is different from other sports. Um, So for motocross, it's an individual sport, essentially. So you have teams which have a few riders on them, but when you race, you race to win because it's you, right? There's no one else. You don't pass the ball to anybody. You're not dependent on anyone else. Um, The team that you have around you is your mechanic, right? Your team sponsors, for example, are help paying for things, paying for the bike, paying for everything to get put together. And it's this close knit team and it's basically all on you as the rider to make it happen. So you have a piece you have to deliver, they have a piece they have to deliver. And the way motocross works, so supercross a little different, not gonna go into that, I'm a bigger motocross fan. Motocross is based on a two moto setup. So a a moto is a race, you race one full race and it's like half an hour plus two laps in the pros. Amateurs are a little bit shorter, of course, because the amount of athletic ability in there. but you you race it out and then you get placed. And then you race out a second one on the same track on the same day or maybe the next day depending on how the setup's done. And then you place the second one. So you could get two different finishes and then you get an overall finish, right? So again, kind of like baseball here with the statistics, uh, your overall finish matters because of your placing. If you end up tying, whoever finished better for the last race gets the edge. Uh, but it's all on you. And the reason I like motocross, the reason it affects me, the reason we're even talking about it on this podcast is because I think it has defined who I am as a person in many, many ways. Um, motocross is different than other sports in the fact that it takes a ton of money to do it. And yet the people that actually do it are those that typically don't have a lot of money. 
So this is kind of an odd kind of area, right? Um, so let's just talk about the cost of this. To get started, right? So say you have, like me, right? Let's say I have not, no bikes here in Texas. I have not, no gear, nothing. Uh, I would have to go out and get a way to transport a bike. So I need like a trailer and an SUV or a truck to pull it, or maybe just a pickup truck because it'll fit in the back, or just a van because you can fit it in the back of a utility van. Um, and then, you know, bikes when I was a kid, I think were about five or $6,000. I think they're like eight to $10,000 now, if I remember correctly. I haven't bought a bike in, I don't know, 15 years. Um, but bikes are expensive. So when I was a kid, right, I had to put down money for a bike and then you end up outgrowing bikes when you're younger and you have to change more classes. So lower classes are for younger kids with smaller bikes. Uh, it's like, for example, the 85 class, I raced in the 125 class, which has all changed date based on two stroke versus four stroke, but that's the whole engine sizing and all that. But anyways, so when you move up, you have to get a new bike. The bigger bikes are about, you know, five, $6,000 when I was a kid. Uh, I think I paid like $55, $5,600 for a bike. And then you have to buy gear. Gear is expensive. Helmets, for example, are gonna be about like $350 when I was a kid. I have no idea how much they cost now. You want a nice helmet, right? You don't wanna screw up your head, especially someone like me who makes money off my thinking and my videos and everything. You don't wanna mess up your head. Um, and then boots are like, I think I paid like $250 when I was a kid. And then the pants were like $150 and the jerseys were like $50 and gloves were like $35. And yes, you have to have all this stuff, this protective gear. And then I raced for a while and messed up my knees. So I have bad knees now. Uh, and then I paid, I think I had like $350, $400 for knee braces because almost every rider has knee braces. And I highly, highly recommend it. If you have kids that are racing or you're racing, you need knee braces. Yes, it's part of the sport. So by the time you're all sunken into this, I mean, you could be out, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars when I was racing. Okay. Prices have gone up now. Um, so you get all this stuff and then you have a trailer and all that, which I didn't even talk about, kind of mentioned at the beginning, but that's another cost or a truck or whatever. And you get all your stuff and you go down to the track and you want to go ride, right? So as a kid, it would cost me $20 to go ride at the track every single time. Um, I couldn't afford that, right? I didn't have the money. I already bought the bike. I already had all the gear and everything. And now I got to pay for gas and oil, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but now you got to pay $20 to ride. I just don't have that type of money. So I would go down to the OHV park, which is like the off-road vehicle. And you would pay like $120 for a tag for the whole year. And I could go every single weekend in the spring, summer, and fall. And I think winters were kind of open sometimes, depending on the conditions. Um, but it was... It was, it was brutal, right? It's $20 to ride if you want to go to the track. Then you go on tracks on, week, on the race season, right? I think it was like $50, I think, to enter, $40, $50 bucks to enter, something like that. Maybe more. I don't, I don't quite recall. It's probably about $40. So you'd pay money to go to race for the day. So you have to load up your bike, load up all your stuff, drive down, get there early in the morning, and then you want to race. You got to pay $40 just to race in the event. And then you gotta eat throughout the day and feed yourself, so you gotta pay for food and all that, and again, you have gas and all that. But one of the big expenses a lot of people don't realize in motocross is you're performing with mechanical machines at peak performance. So literally everything breaks all the time. Um, so again, a lot of things don't break during races, but they also do. You watch professional races, you'll see people you know, have accidents, things happen, bikes break, things don't work out, and it costs you money. And so for me, the hardest part, I think, in motocross, and one of the things, I just have a lot of respect for the people in the community and industry. Um, motocross is not one of those high social class sports, okay? When I go to like a supercross or a motocross event and you see the people around, they're like blue collar, salt of the earth people, right? A lot of Americans, I don't think, I don't know, a lot of quants, for example, on my channel, you'd be appalled. I. <laughs> I can say that, uh, but I really enjoy going. I enjoy being with those types of people. Uh, they're more humble, especially when you're a racer. So most people that go to these events, right, they ride themselves and they've dedicated all their time and effort and money to riding and racing on themselves, or they're just a hobbyist. Again, it costs a lot of money. Uh, they don't have a lot of money to start with. When I was a kid, I didn't have that much money. So again, right, I grew up middle class, but for the majority of the part, my parents would help where they could. And they did here and there, right? I got a few of my bikes my parents purchased. Uh, one of my bikes, one and a half of my bikes I paid for. Um, but you put all this money on, even if your parents buy you everything to start. The issue is, is that you have to have a ton of capital to keep going. 
And so this is where I think a lot of the struggle, the character building for me comes from, is that you get a bike and you get all your stuff and you wanna go race and you wanna race on the track. You wanna pay the $20 for the track to be competitive, right? When you don't have the money for that, you have to take the second best option. Um, but like I was mentioning here, the cost to do this on the repair side is huge. Parts are going out, so you have to replace pistons, I think like every 100 hours of racing. Um, I would extend mine out further. Um, I had to teach myself how to do all the mechanical work, or at least as much of it as possible. I would try things, and if it broke, it sucked, you have to retry it again. Or like one of the things I couldn't do was swapping bearings and bottom ends, so I'd have to take it to a mechanic. Um, but again, you do this out of necessity, and there's a there's a grind in the industry of those that compete. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't understand, they don't realize, and I don't think you get this in a lot of other sports. So right, for football, basketball, you can join the high school team and you can just go and play. And yes, it costs some money if you want the nicer shoes and the nicer gear, and you might need to travel. And of course you could do a training camp or whatever. But for motocross, the financial burden, the amount of exercise and fitness and training that goes into this and the mechanical efforts and knowledges and ability on this are huge and they're detrimental. And you see the amount of stress and struggle in the industry a lot more than I think any other sport. So for me, this is part of what defines me, right? So as I was talking about, right, you, you get your bike together and I'd go down and I'd race for the weekend. And I remember I had probably one of the best races of my life. I was terrible on starts. I came out of the gates, I think like third place, second, third place. Within one corner out of the gate, I was already in first. I made it all around the first lap. I was going into the whoop section, so there's different small bumps all put together. And my bike just dies. So I roll the bike off, I'm so upset, right? I lost basically all this, I've been all doing all this training, all this effort, you get to this point and you realize you blew a bottom end. So you start thinking about that, you're like, oh man, this is gonna be like four or $500 to fix it. I could do it myself, right? I gotta figure that out. If I can do it myself, I can save a bunch of money. I don't know how to do this. So you gotta pay someone to do it. And so then you roll the bike back to the car and you're covered in mud. You've been training for weeks, months, right? Years trying to get this done. And it's just not happening. And then the financial burden on motocross really builds on you. So as I mentioned, right, you have this repair that comes up and you go and you spend all your money to do it. Well, now you can't afford to race next weekend. So now you have to take off one or two races. Then you save up enough money, so now you're working all these side jobs behind the scenes. So for me in high school, I was always working on different projects around, trying to get some extra money. And then I got enough money for gas, I got enough money to fix the bike, and now you go down and you race, and you practice, and you do another race, and then you crash this weekend, right? And I've seen people, people I knew, uh, broken arms, broken legs, collarbones, one kid in one of my lower classes, I think he was probably, I don't know, about 12 or 14 died. So I had a handlebar go through his heart. Uh, the sport is just brutal. It's really, really brutal. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot more training than other people. And again, it's that financial and mental stress of how do you fix the bike? How do you pay for the bike? Now you gotta work a second job while you're racing. So if you wanna be competitive, you have to do that. Um, a lot of professionals you'll see as kids growing up, parents will sell everything, right? They want their kid to be successful. They want their kid to win. They'll sell everything. They sell their house. They sell you know the cars they don't need. They don't go on vacations. Uh, they're living in an RV now with their kid traveling throughout the country. So luckily my parents didn't bank all that on me, right? <laughs> There'd be a lot of pressure as a kid as well. Um, but I think those are really big character building skills that help develop who I am as a person. So I remember going through mud races. So one thing you guys probably don't understand either is when you do a mud race, for example, when it rains and it pours, they don't cancel events. If it's lightning, there'll be a pause. They might cancel it if there's a lot of lightning. But if it's pouring rain, like buckets of rain, there's no canceling, right? Everyone's trained for this. Everyone's gonna be there. Everyone's spent thousands of dollars to get to this race. You're gonna race it and we're gonna see who's the best, right? And doing this is just brutal. I remember coming off of one of my races and I remember I qualified for a amateur quali pre-qualifier. Um, and one of the guys that was fa a lot faster than me, he didn't qualify. And I got that spot because guess what? He didn't make it, right? The mud took him out. Um, you're covered from head to toe. If your gloves touch any mud when you're racing, when a bike falls and you fall, because it's gonna fall, trust me, it's good. you're gonna go down at one point. 
you have mud all over your gloves. Now when you go to get back on your bike, there's no pause, right? No one's gonna hold it for you. There's no equal equal rights thing where everyone says, oh, we're gonna all start over, make sure we all have this great, wonderful, frilly event going on, right? You you have to get back on the bike and your mud, they're just, your gloves are just muddy. And now you're just slipping all over the place. It's, it's brutal. Um, but the sport itself has taught me a lot of dedication and character, right? It's easy to say, okay, I went, I tried, I give up. It costs too much money, I give up. I don't wanna work multiple jobs, I give up, right? It's easy just to throw in the towel. And I think motocross is one of those few sports that is very just grueling physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. It's one of those things that just really grinds you out as a person. And it's why when I go to these races and events, right, you look down at the starting gates, and I, right, I always root for the guy who's my favorite, right? Right now it's Eli Tomac. I'm a big, you know, a big fan of Eli. Uh, he's somewhat like me in the fact, right? He's not super social. He doesn't want to be out there in like the public media and everything, but he is just amazing. He does a lot of hard training, puts in the work. Um, but I always root for this, the privateer guys as well. So for those of you that don't know, right? The way motocross works too is this isn't like you sign a contract, right? Like the NBA where you have, okay, there's so many teams. If you get hired, you work on a team. So motocross has contracts for the professionals. So like Kawasaki, Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, KTM, and Husqvarna all have these contracts. And then there's those are like the factory rides, right? You want to be on there. They pay more. You're definitely the best around these teams. Now there's like lower level teams now where it's like, you know, they're becoming bigger though. They're competing with factory. But you have these other teams and they're like brands that are other brands that aren't the manufacturers, not the factory rides. Uh, and they support you and provide parts and bikes and all that as well. A privateer is someone who's basically paying their own way. There's no salary for them. There's no pay for them, okay? So these guys have sponsors. So for example, I had sponsors when I was a kid. I got like a discount on specific parts. Uh, a lot of these privateer guys, it's the same thing, right? A shop is giving them a free bike, okay? They want the branding, they want the marketing. Um, the company's giving them a free helmet, a free this, a free that. But that's it. There's not really a lot of compensation and money. Sometimes some brands will pay you a little bit more because you make it to the races. And I had friends and people I kind of knew through people in the industry, in the racing industry, um, that were privateer riders. And I saw one of them at one of the races, like, I don't know, five, six, seven years, maybe eight years after I left my hometown. And I just like messaged them and said, like, dude, I saw you racing on there. Congrats. Like, I can't believe you made it in the pros. Like, big accomplishment, right? And they're finishing like last place, last place in a race, which you think is terrible. Right, And that's another emotional part of it is being able to race every single week, putting in the time, putting in the money, putting in the effort, the injury, the exercise, the blood, sweat, and tears that actually physically go into this, and then finishing last or second to last or finishing mid-pack over and over and over again. It's really tough mentally, physically on you. It's just brutal. Um, and so, again, going back to these privateer riders, they're right. you see them out there, you see them racing, uh, they're not getting really paid to do this, right? You're competing at the highest level and you're struggling to make it work. And I love to see these guys make it because it's that underdog mentality, right? And you can't really appreciate the riders. You can't really appreciate the sport, at least in my opinion, without you doing the work, with you putting it in, with you financially not being able to make it, without you making things happen. And yes, there are rich kids that their parents buy them two or three bikes. They have a backup bike and they have all this gear. They usually don't do very well, okay? And I think this comes back down, so now to the quantitative finance part here, this comes down to the character building aspect, right? If somebody hands you things and they make things easy, and I see this consistently in finance and banking and quantitative finance in different industries with professionals in it, right? Those that come from very high social class families, they typically have great education, right? They have everything they need. They don't have to struggle at all. They don't see all right, the blood, sweat, and tears that go in behind the scenes. And they've never struggled with it. So they just sail their way through and they get in the industry and they get a job and they're mediocre at best. But they don't understand what it really takes to be the best in that, that situation here. And I think that's what motocross has really kind of put on me as a person is that you have to grind and you have to struggle and you have to push. And when every week when I know I'm a loser, right? I'm dead last every single week in a, in a race series, which has happened to me, right? 
you can look at it and say, well, it's not fair. It's not fair I don't have the money or I don't, I'm not able to practice at the track like these kids are practicing every single week, right? It's not fair that no one's gonna pay my way and it's gonna give me, you know, money to repair my bike and to practice there weekly. And it's not fair I don't have an advantage. So you can pay to upgrade your bike and do different things to it. It's not fair that I don't have that. But that's not the point you need to make. You need to just buckle down, put your head down and learn to work with what you've got. And I think that's where the character building exercise come from. Uh, that's what's made me so much more tenacious in the quant finance industry. It's the reason I have essentially not the perfect get background, but I end up beating out everybody. And it's really hard to explain this to people because you explain this to a lot of young people, especially those in finance, and they've like, egos are blown up massively huge. They're overly aggressive. They're overly confident. And I think they're going to make it happen. That's completely different than being able to put your head down and grind through the terrible times. Okay. Right. I see this a lot. I see a lot of these young guys say, you know, oh, I'm excited. I want to get in quant finance. I've got a finance degree. I'll do anything to make it happen. You're not willing to do anything to make it happen. Most of you. And I think that's, that's the difference between those that are successful. Those that get promoted throughout longer careers, right? Being a, doing a career is, is brutal. I think a lot of people don't realize this for a lot of executives. Getting to that point, getting to that pinnacle, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of years, a lot of struggle, a lot of nonsensical garbage. So throughout this whole podcast series here, I hope you guys have seen from Closed Doors season two here, right? Um, us talking about like education, right? Uh, us talking about, you know, politics, building social capital, right? There's all these things that aren't necessarily fun behind closed doors, getting passed over for, for promotions, right? Working really hard and not getting noticed for things that happen constantly. Uh, being fired, let go, demoted, passed over promotions based on politics, right? It happens. Uh, academically, I think the amount of stress and rigor to really perform well as a quant is far more than people are willing to do. And it's why the industry can't find, at least in my opinion, right, good quants. They don't exist. I mean, I have a master's degree, which is awesome. I've worked with students with MFE degrees from the top programs in the country and in the world. They underperformed. I worked alongside with PhDs. They've underperformed. Again, I just don't see, um, again, that character scar. You need the character. You need to do things bigger, better, harder, longer, and stronger. And I don't see that in most people in the industry. It's very hard to build. But again, I think you have to struggle through it. You have to find something you truly love, you're passionate about, you're willing to basically die for and just throw everything else in life away for this one thing. And so, again, if these masters and PhD students, if they dedicate their entire lives and souls to being the best quant out there, right? I mean, I'm sitting here looking at book reviews for people reading through books I read I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. And then on top of that, so a little bit of a spoiler for those of you on YouTube, which I guess you can't see this on the podcast, but I just held up a book for probability and stats and inferences, which is an introductory book for someone that was had some questions. And then I'm reviewing other books like this is Introduction to Stochastic Calculus with Applications. Most people are never going to really understand stochastic calculus from the inside out, from the financial perspective, from the nitty gritty details from the ground up. And the reason being is the books are brutal. Um, the material is brutal. And even if you go through a program, so you go through a, a really good quant program will have you take at least at minimum two to three stochastic calculus application courses. So courses focused around stochastic calculus. Um, but again, you do that, it's not enough. You have to go out there and do it again and again and again. I mean, I'm shooting a podcast here on a holiday here on a Monday on Labor Day on September 7th. It's 9.34 at night and I'm shooting a podcast, right? It's not always fun. <laughs> Trust me, sometimes I wish I didn't have to do a lot of what I do. But again, I like doing it from the overall perspective. You endure the pain, you endure the character building exercises here, right? That nitty gritty piece that kind of makes you who you are because you enjoy doing it from the bigger picture, right? Like I, overall, I'm happy and I'm excited and I enjoy doing quantitative finance. So when I'm reading through these books for book reviews, right, I'm still trying to learn more information. I'm still trying to enhance myself, right? But reading through hundreds of pages of a mathematical book is just rigorous. It, it's grueling, right? It is what it is, right? You can't just read things to read things. You really got to internalize it, study it. So just to wrap this podcast up a little bit here, right? Sports wise, motocross has taught me a lot about building character. It's taught about the grit. It's taught about, you know, pushing things to the limits. There's risk involved in racing, right? You could die. You could get injured. Bad things can happen. You have no money, right? It, to do that, you have to work another job just to be able to afford to do your hobby, sport, side career, whatever, right? 
it's a lot of grind. And I remember just vividly sitting on the back of a trailer um, and I just lost, my bike went out, another issue, I think a top in blue, or I lo and I lost a clutch in the mud race. And just sitting there and the people that came to even watch me race just bailed. They just left, right? I had no one there to support me. And so you're just sitting on the back of this trailer, your bike's tilted against the trailer, it's just dripping in mud. I remember I still having the helmet on and I'm, I've got mud on my gloves and my body, I've been roosted. So people shoot mud at you when they're racing on the track. And I remember just having my helmet on and just the water dripping off of my face and the wet goggles, there's foam on the goggles, just sitting on your face and just sitting there like, feeling like you've lost everything, right? I've spent all this money, I've spent all this time, all this dedication, and what do I got, right? I'm sitting here, I'm soaked in mud, no one's here to support me, no one's got my back. Right? I'm out of money. I'm going to have to fix this clutch. I don't have the cash to do it. I want to race next weekend and be back in the game. Right? And then you start thinking about life in general behind you. Right? I got school. I got family. I got other things going on. Right? What am I doing here? And those are the rough times. Those are the times where you have to push forward. Um, those are the times that make or break people. I think those hardest times when everything seems so dark and the world seems like there's nothing left for it. That's when you have to make yourself shine, right? That's when you need to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You need to push forward and realize there's more to life than what you're doing, right? So in that race, right, I've got all kinds of stuff to live for outside of that. I have all kinds of stuff to work on past that. Uh, in the quantum world, I've had very dark moments as well, which I haven't talked about too much. But when you make it through those and you can rationalize yourself that you're on the right path, things are okay, you're going to get better... Those are the points I think that make you a stronger person, that make you better than others, right? You're going to push through things that others can't do, right? You have that character kind of built into you. So motocross, my favorite sport, hands down, right? I think it's the best of sports. It's the hardest of sports. It's just out there. Um, I love it. It's taught me a lot of skills and life skills. But I hope you guys had some takeaways in here that building character is hard. So I think for me, a lot of people ask me, Drew, how do you build character? I, I mean, I don't know, put yourself in crappy situations and see if you can make it through, right? And if you don't make it through, like, then that's kind of a, <laughs> not a good idea. Um, so, I mean, you might just give up and say, I'm not going to do this anymore, right? That's the optimal solution to give up. Uh, but again, here, building this is hard. Building character is an internal, personal thing. I think it'll benefit you everywhere in life. Um, Sports-wise, a little bit of tidbits about me, right? You learned I like motocross, something exciting, something different. Um, but anyways... Thanks for listening, and as always, until next time.